This is the Bloomberg Surveillance Podcast. I'm Carol Masser, along with Manis Cranny and Katie Greifeld. Join us each day for insight from the best in economics, geopolitics, finance, and investment. Subscribe to Bloomberg Surveillance on demand at Apple, Spotify, and anywhere you get your podcasts. And always on Bloomberg.com, the Bloomberg Terminal, and of course, on the Bloomberg Business app. Let's see how much sleep maybe Sam Stovall got. He's chief investment strategist at CFRA, joining us on this Friday. Uh, There is so much to talk about, Sam, as we get ready to wrap up. Uh, A wild year, one for the textbooks, I feel like, in so many ways. Um, As you sit here uh, on this December, as we get ready for the last trading day here in the United States, how are you thinking about the year that was and the year that might be? Well, good morning, Carol, and good morning, morning, everybody. Um, I'm basically thinking that uh, looking forward to 2024 also being a good year. Um, History tells us that great years traditionally are followed by good years uh, that gains in excess of 20 percent in one calendar year lead to double digit gains uh, in the second year, basically a 300 basis point improvement over the long term average with a 10 percentage point uh, increase in the frequency of advance. So basically you letting your your winners ride from one year to the next. So every day we've got to come up with a new way to ask you whether you want to be long <laughs> the MAG7 relative to the breadth of the... There are 493 other stocks. So find another version of it. If you think you're going to get a, a double-digit return, the question is then, within MAG7, they are expected to see their earnings growth rise by 22% next year. That's twice the S&P 500 advance. I mean, there's an irrevocability of having to have MAG7 as a portion of your equity exposure. So is it still overexposed to MAG7 or do you go for breadth? I think you go for breadth, but what you do is you broaden out within those sectors that have done so well. Uh, again, going back to 1990, if you were to be holding on to the three best performing sectors from an up year into the new year, you ended up beating the market 70% of the time. And the focus being that now you drift down into the second, maybe third tier level. So semiconductors having 105% improvement on a sub industry level with than the S&P 1500, you would stick with that group, but you might, instead of looking at NVIDIA, you might be looking at Broadcom, you might be looking at Marvell Technology, et cetera. So you stick with the winning sectors, but you might broaden out uh, to the second and third tier companies. Can I ask you though, Sam, why not stay with NVIDIA? I feel like, you know what, Manus, if we talk about AI chips, that is still the company that everybody says has to beat. I was listening to something from Ian King overnight. You know, we're waiting for their, you know, accelerator chips that are about to come. I mean, why not go with the leader? Oh, we we still recommend NVIDIA. Uh, Angelo Zeno, our tech specialist, uh, is saying that this is a company that is likely to be a leader for quite some time. Uh, I think that what I was saying is that we're also going to see others. Maybe we turn it into the Magnificent 14 or so, uh, but we basically broaden out those groups that are likely to benefit. I mean, it's interesting that you say tier three, tier three, going from NVIDIA 238% performance to Broadcom at 100%. But I I get your point. How much exceptional breadth would you take? We caught up with uh, Nat Alliance Alliance Bernstein yesterday, and they talked about a sweet spot for junk, a sweet spot for for many of these slightly riskier markets. How much risk uh, do you want to put into portfolios next year? How much breadth? I mean, they talk about junk being in a sweet spot. What's the equivalent for you in the equity world? Well, uh, when you when you deal with risk, I guess it depends on the individual. I like to say I'm so conservative, I wear a belt and suspenders. Uh, but I think when you look to historical precedent and you see that we are in an election year for a first term administration, the market has gained 100 percent of the time since World War II with an average total return of 15 and a half percent. We're in the second year of a bull market, typically up 12 and a half percent, rising 85 percent of the time. And I has as I just mentioned, whenever we're in a year following a 20 plus percent advance, uh, the market has done exceptionally well in that second year. So I would tend to say that uh, if you have added to the risk in this fourth quarter, Mm -hmm. 
uh, stick with that higher risk. Um, and if you do believe that uh, there is more risk potential for 2024, uh, I think we're a bit overbought right now. And once we get into the new calendar year, when people can take their uh, profits and then defer taxes for another year, uh, then I would say look to buy on those dips. Well, let's talk about this from a sector perspective, because you write in your notes that following up years, it's best to let your winners ride. I want to talk about the other side of that. Do you let your losers continue to lose? You take a look <laughs> at utilities, energy, staples, leading losses this year. Do you just stay away from them in 2024? Well, obviously, we do have recommendations in all three of those sectors, but from a weighting pers uh, perspective, we would continue to recommend underweighting these groups, mainly because there's an awful lot of overhead resistance, and uh, if there is the emphasis toward growth, toward risk, etc., investors are going to continue to focus on those growth leaders. So I would tend to say that while you could see a drifting higher of some of these groups from a relative strength perspective, they're likely to be underperformers yet. And I want to uh, get specific here and run through some names because I'm taking a look at the stocks that you've uh, specified in financials. Charles Schwab. Schwab is a really interesting name to me because obviously it was one of the babies perhaps thrown out with the bathwater in what we saw with March, and it really hasn't recovered. You take a look at shares down about 16% for 2023. What's the thinking around Charles Schwab at this juncture? Well, uh, I like to say that fundamentals tell you what, but uh, technicals tell you when and how far. So I like to combine uh, CFRA equity analyst recommendations along with our Lowry Research technical uh, assistance area. So, you know, seeing where the momentum relative strength happens to be. So Charles Schwab, basically, it's an extreme undervaluation situation. Uh, it's almost trading at about half of what it normally trades. Also, we're looking at an environment uh, in, in which uh, the concern, I think, is just totally overblown. So with the prospect of another good year in the marketplace, benefiting the investment banks and brokers, uh, one that is oversold uh, and really has not reached its potential is Schwab. Hey, Sam, our most read story on the Bloomberg, it's a story put together by a bunch of our reporters, and it says Wall Street's best and brightest flopped once again in 2023, basically saying that at the end of 2022, everyone, it seemed, was game planning for the recession they were convinced was coming. There's a lot of things that came out seemingly from nowhere. Regional banking, uh, the concerns there, Russia, Ukraine, that war continuing, then, of course, the Middle East conflict. As you look ahead, uh, and you obviously have laid out your scenario, you know, what what are the things, though, that we must keep on our radar that maybe could just kind of come out of nowhere? Well, as Manus was saying early on in the program is, when will the Fed start to cut and by how much? Our belief is that they're going to cut three times in 2024, starting in the second quarter, uh, mainly because the Fed doesn't want to make the mistakes that they did in the late 70s. They want to ensure that inflation, like a campfire, is fully doused uh, before they start to uh, cut interest rates. Uh, so our belief is that only if we end up with a hard landing Rather than a soft landing, will the Fed be more aggressive from an, a rate cutting perspective? Also, adding geopolitical issues, uh, should we find that there's an, a broadening of the Middle East tensions and conflict uh, and the total shutdown of the Red Sea? We still are having some shipping firms that are willing to uh, venture in there, but a total shutdown, a, a jump in oil prices, those could obviously upend uh, the year ahead forecast. Yeah, already a full play it feels like for the new year. Hey, Sam, thank you so much. Happy New Year. Uh, always appreciate all the time you give us here at Bloomberg. Sam Stovall over at CFRA. Uh, a lot to talk about. I mean, Apple's had a very good year. The stock is up to, I think, just shy of 50 percent here in 2023. So uh, and a lot of stories and a lot of concerns this week in terms of litigation, stopping sales of uh, the Apple Watch, but coming back on board. So no offense, guys. I'd love to talk to you, but I really want to talk to Mark Gurman <laughs> about it. His Bloomberg chief correspondent, Apple expert, has written a bunch about Apple always, but also this week. Mark, good to have you here. We know it's early. I think you're on the West Coast, uh, so it is kind of early. Um, talk to us about the watch specifically in terms of the back and forth, pulling it off the market, putting it back on the market. Patent litigation, I feel like when it comes to technology companies, you're, it's a kind of a given. But how should we be thinking about it, at least for the the investment side and the investor audience. 
Sure. Thank you so much for having me. So I'll start off by saying that the Apple Watch, one of Apple's most premier products, being pulled from sale in the U.S., uh, that's unprecedented. That just doesn't happen. When the ITC said in October that Apple would have to pull the watch from store shelves uh, after a 60-day review period, that's how we ended up uh, with this happening during the week between Christmas and New Year's. I think a lot of people believe that there would be there would be no way Apple would get to this point. Either Apple would figure out some sort of settlement, either they would issue a software update, they would convince the Biden administration to veto the order from the Trade Commission. I think it was very surprising, including to myself, when these things actually got pulled from store shelves. Now, the ban, for all intents and purposes, really only lasted a few days because Apple just a couple days ago got an emergency order through an appeals court in D.C. that got them to put the watch back on the market. Now, this is temporary, right? Apple still has to put a software fix in place uh, or another type of fix. And that fix is being reviewed by the U.S. Customs Agency. There was actually a hearing yesterday on Thursday. Uh, We don't know how the hearing went at this point because it's all closed door stuff. But by mid-January, we should have some sort of answer from the Customs Agency whether or not the fix via software that Apple has proposed for the watch is sufficient enough to no longer, in their view, violate the patents from a company called Mossimo, a medical device company that say Apple infringed and got the ITC to pull the watch from Apple stores in the U.S. Hey, Mark, are we naive to just assume that Apple's going to figure this one out and they'll be able to keep their watches uh, on shelves in the future? Uh, I think we were naive to believe that this wouldn't happen. I think we're less naive to believe that Apple is on the verge of figuring this out. There's going to be a resolution here sometime in January, I believe. Uh, If the U.S. Customs Agency accepts Apple's software fix, uh, it's game over, right? This watch is back on sale. Mossimo will go after Apple again. Uh, The two companies have been in court. They have a round two of their trial related to patents and trade secret theft. Uh, that's kicking off in late October of 2024. For those unfamiliar, Mossimo sued Apple in 2020 over patent infringement. There was actually a trial this year. It ended in a mistrial due to a hung jury. Uh, for this type of trial, you needed uh, all the jurors to be in agreement one way or another, but it was actually six to one in Apple's favor. So both Apple and Mossimo lost. So they've got history and they've, the and they've got form. They've got form on that. Let, can we just sort of because uh, c- those legal wrangles are, are going to continue. If you look at the wearables part of the business, I know there's a number that Katie's keeping an eye on. The wearables is 10 percent of the revenue. We had Dan Ives with us a little bit earlier in the week and he evangelized at a four trillion dollar valuation on Apple. A, how quickly do you think it could make that valuation, but more importantly, how important is China to that? Because again, there's regulatory sniping from the Chinese on the ownership of iPhones, and iPhones are 77% of the, of the revenue lineup for Apple. Yeah, I'll tell you this, you could be quite successful by constantly betting that Apple's going to be okay long term and their market cap is going to keep growing. Uh, so, you know, I see every scenario in the book that Apple gets the $4 trillion. Uh, I'm not sure it'll be in 2024, but it will happen eventually. And it's typically a bad bet to go against Apple, right? Uh, in terms of China, there have been these reports from us and others uh, about the, the government banning the iPhone and other non-Chinese made devices in certain offices and certain organizations within the country. Uh, I think it's really going to take until Apple reveals its first quarter results at the tail end of January or early February to see what revenue is like in China to get a full scope of that impact. The last revenue results that we got for Apple, that was the fourth quarter. They did okay in China. They they really didn't decline much. It was pretty solid overall. The, the issue for us in, in terms of trying to determine what that means is that it only incorporated very few days of iPhone 15 sales uh, in the overall Q4 earnings. So it's really difficult to know until Apple actually puts those numbers out because otherwise we're just guessing. So a lot of the time, the detractors of Apple would say the the scale and the speed of radical innovation, radical product product development, has perhaps slowed down. Where do they? What does Apple need, as it were, to get to four trillion? Does it need multiple refreshes, which we get, or, or does it need something perhaps more Damascene esque? 
That's undoubtedly true. The pace of device redesigns uh, has slowed down to an incredible degree. If you look at the iPhone 15 Pro, sure, it has pretty great new materials. It has a very advanced processor, the first three nanometer chip uh, to ship in volume in a smartphone. But if you put that thing in a case, or even if you don't put it in a case, it's going to, for the most part, look and feel uh, almost the same as an iPhone you bought three or four years ago. But that doesn't necessarily matter. It's the ecosystem, it's the lock-in, it's the services, it's the attached products like the AirPods, the Apple Watch, the Apple TV and others, which has really created this moat for the company that's gonna help it uh, continue to grow. And I think for 2024, you have some pretty cool products on the roadmap. The Apple Vision Pro, their first mixed reality headset, that's gonna go on sale in about one month from now. That's not gonna drive a lot of revenue for Apple, mm -hmm. but it's probably going to add for the next two two years, probably between two and five billion in annual revenue. Uh, and on a quarterly basis, that could be the difference between you know a couple percent growth or a couple percent decline. Uh, so that could be important in the short term, but critical in the long term. You're going to see larger iPhones uh, mm. in the fall. They're moving from a 6.1 inch to a 6.3 inch on the smaller phone, uh, and from 6.7 inches to 6.9 inches on the bigger phone. Now, to your questions about China, that's very important because in China, lots of consumers are shifting to one device instead of having an iPad, an iPhone, a Mac, a watch, etc. A lot of people are just buying phones and mm -hmm. they want the biggest ones that they can get their hands on. And so that 6.9 inch iPhone 16 Pro Max, that's going to be pretty important for that market. I really don't understand the uh, the desire for a larger phone, but I want to talk about the Vision Pro a I little bit. Vision I'm <laughs> sure you remember the video of when they unveiled the Vision Pro and they read out the price of it and the audience gasped. Uh, it was a viral moment. It was pretty funny. Who's going to buy these? Is this just people who love Apple, Apple enthusiasts? And are we going to see the price tag come down from several thousands of dollars? Yeah, you're going to see software developers who want to develop for the platform. You're going to see uh, mixed reality enthusiasts. You're going to see not the early adopters. I think the early adopters are the people who buy the new iPhones the first day or week they come out. But I think you're going to see the early, early, early adopters, right? That is an even more niche audience. I'm not expecting lines outside of, of Apple stores. You know, they believe over the course of a year, they're only going to sell a couple of these at most a day in each of its retail stores, right? So this is a niche product, probably uh, in the same spectrum as people who would buy a Mac Pro or a high-end Mac Studio. Yeah. Those are the company's most expensive Macs, right? right. You're talking $3,500, plus $500 in tax uh, in the U.S. Yeah, not not for the lighthearted or the, the small pocketbooks. No. Um, Mark, always appreciate it. Mark is always my go-to. Is it time for me to upgrade a watch, a phone? That's who I talk to. Mark Gurman, thank you so much. Happy New Year. Bloomberg's own Mark Gurman. When it comes to Apple, a must-read here at Bloomberg. Let's take these discussions to our next guest. Terry Haynes is the founder of Pangea Policy. Terry, good morning to you. I mean, you lay it out very punchily, so well done to you. This is what you say about Washington. Uh, let's just start with the, the geopolitical situation there, because they haven't funded uh, Ukraine and they're reluctant to fund Israel. They've got two hot wars. But you say this, Washington's lazy bar minimum approach on everything, whether it's border security, foreign aid, or building fiscal crisis of great concern to markets, won't cut it in 2024, not for markets, not for the U.S. national and international interests. We've ignored, markets have essentially ignored these faux pas, these grand faux pas. We've ignored them. Is it our folly to ignore these and which is the biggest tail risk? Well, I think what you've got, Manus, here is a situation where you haven't seen in 50 years, where you've got combination of uh, probably the highest geopolitical risk and probably the highest domestic local risk as well. Those things combine. I think what markets ignore is that uh, going into 2024 with that combination uh, very simply is, you know, they tend to see political issues by and large as uh, spices one way or the other, uh, you know, things that uh, that things that aren't fundamental to the markets but uh, you know, provide some some minor up or down action uh, when what they should consider is that lower geopolitical risk and lower 
domestic political risk in the United States are both foundational to the markets. And, uh, and you know, we haven't really had had a major conflict uh, in the United States that shook markets since the Second World War. But when it did, uh, you know, the markets went down by 20 percent uh, in the first six months after Pearl Harbor. And, you know, we're, I'm talking about a conflict that happened almost 80 years ago right. in a conflict in which, you know, the, not as today, more than half of the United States uh, citizens are invested in the markets. So the foundational risks here, I think, generally are uh, in the volatility. Terry, are, are Terry, fun- let's get more specific, though. Play it out. Uh, if markets are ignoring geopolitical risk, what might you, what might likely happen in 2024 when it comes to the geopolitical risks? And we've kind of laid them out um, all throughout the week. Obviously, we continue to watch what's going on in the Middle East and concerns about escalation. You still have Russia and Ukraine. We're looking at China and Taiwan. And then, you know, you've got an election coming up. I think there's some concerns, nervousness here. So play it out specifically what you think likely could happen that investors have to be wary of. Uh, I think fundamentally, the, 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 there will be a temptation to think that the, uh, the the three major conflict areas geopolitically that you just pointed out, uh, Ukraine, Israel, Taiwan, uh, are, are going to be somehow handled uh, when, in fact, they're going to continue on for months. I mean, there's no easy end to the Ukraine war. Uh, the Israelis say that the Hamas war will go on for months, uh, and I don't see anything there to stop it. And there's a lot of volatility around Taiwan, which I think, frankly, is under underappreciated uh, uh, by markets uh, who think that uh, Biden and Xi Jinping have some sort of a, uh, a, a an agreement after their recent summit, uh, when in fact uh, what China is doing is is pushing on kind of undeterred and uh, and probably has more rather than less uh, uh, incentives to act uh, thanks to their uh, more parlous political si- or excuse me economic situation. Uh, so there's all that, and then you and then you're going to have a lot of points in the uh, in, in domestic politics uh, with uh, with primaries coming up mm-hmm. over the next several months. Who are going to be the nominees? Will there continue to be rising third party challenges? As I've I've thought and continue to think there will be. Uh, you know exactly what is the direction of the United States uh, both domestically and in terms of its own foreign policy. Those will play out in you know in in specific points, uh, you know, at least once or twice a month through the year. Uh, and uh, and I think you have the opportunity to to put additional volatility into the markets hey, as we're unsure about the future direction of the United States. Terry, I don't want to be inflammatory. I just want to be smart here for our audience. When we talk about a third world war, when I look at our Bloomberg intelligence team and when they're putting out um, research when it comes to what we need to watch on the global economy and top of the line or top of the headline is about war. So how do we need to think about the possibility of a third world war? Uh, You know, in some ways, and I'm not trying to be inflammatory either, I'll give you a different way of thinking about it, though. In a lot of ways, we already are. Uh, Mm. You know, there there are at least three regional conflicts. Uh, There's uh, there's cyber war. There's a concern about how the, uh, the the contending parties uh, move into space. There is there are concerns about uh, how they're, they're moving around in even in the Arctic, for example. Uh, so, you know, you've got kind of a slow moving conflict right now. And I'm not trying to be inflammatory or push it uh, or push it too far either. Uh, but what I will say is that anybody that's looking at uh, the current three hot spots as uh, solely regional conflicts and not representative of a larger conflict uh, isn't thinking about this enough. And uh, you know, the economic consequences alone, uh, as you all just noted on supply chains and uh, in the Red Sea and many other things, uh, could be very substantial. So, you know, we are in a very uh, we're in a very volatile situation already, even though markets don't fully understand it, realize it or appreciate it. So there's a lot to worry about on the global front. Let's go back domestic, though, because uh, you write in a recent note, you talk about Washington's out of control fiscal spending, increasing debt service costs. Maybe we saw some of those concerns play out in the Treasury market in the summer. But uh, looking at the state of play right now, it seems like that was a blip. But what's the trajectory there when you think about the fiscal side of the equation? 
Washington, Washington always thinks that uh, they understand the markets and the markets always think they understand Washington and that Washington is responsive to markets. Uh, I've never thought that was true. And we've probably got the biggest gap uh, between Washington and the markets in some time. Increasingly, markets are asking, uh, you know, when and whether the uh, United States government is going to be able to get its fiscal spending under control. And uh, there, there's no movement at all towards doing that. You know, you have a situation in Washington right now where, you know, the the, the most uh, the, the people are banging their, their fists on the table the most to control spending are people that are, you know, ironically to some extent, uh, conservative Republicans. But really what they're doing is talking about about as much as 1% out of 30%, uh, the discretionary part of the overall federal budget. And that's a blip, and that's by no means what anybody expects. So the, the discrepancy between what markets want in terms of uh, more sustainable fiscal policy and what Washington is, it, it can deliver, there's a huge gap, and there's no, in, there, there's no indication that Washington even understands what markets uh, want or expect there. Terry, we'll have to see how these uh, negotiations go down to uh, the wire this month in regards to the potential risks. Uh, and as you say, there is a great disconnect uh, between markets and Washington. Uh, let them rule. We rule our own way, uh, say the bond equity and commodity traders. Terry Hens, Pangea Policy. Angela Stent is here with us. She's non-resident senior fellow at the Brookings Institution. She's author of Putin's World. She understands uh, Vladimir Putin so well. She has worked, uh, uh, done national intelligence uh, for Russia and Eurasia at the National Intelligence Council, so really understands uh, a lot when it comes to geopolitics. Angela, good to have you here as we get ready to wrap up 2023. This latest barrage by Russia shows that, what, to you, that this war is long from over? Oh, yes, this war is going to continue um, well into 2024, despite stories that occasionally appear in our media about Putin being willing to negotiate. Uh, he's defined this as an existential, existential issue for him, uh, the survival of his regime. Um, and as we saw today, this was, I think, the deadliest attack, again, hitting civilian targets um, mercilessly and, uh, uh, you know, anger that the Ukrainians were able to destroy this amphibious uh, Russian warship in Crimea uh, this week. This was a major gain for the Ukrainians, but still uh, they, are, they are fighting very hard to uh, maintain their position. Angela, I do wonder that geopolitically there's a lot going on around the world, to say the least. It's an understatement with what's going on in the Middle East. And I do wonder how global allies are preoccupied with so much and how that might impact their support of something like uh, the Russian war in Ukraine. Right. So for Putin, you know, the Israel-Hamas war has been a godsend. Uh, attention has been diverted uh, to what's happening in the Middle East, away from Russia, Ukraine. And then, of course, you have uh, this... Debates within the United States, our Congress couldn't agree on a major um, $60 billion aid package for Ukraine. They went away. Uh, they may be able to agree on it in January, but it's, of course, tied to all these issues of border security. The European Council was unable to vote on a 50 billion euro tranche of financial support for Ukraine because Viktor Orban, the Hungarian prime minister, vetoed it. They're also trying to get around this. But the Ukrainians are now saying that they cannot pay pensions going forward if they don't get this money from the European Union. So uh, allies are distracted. They're dealing with their own domestic issues. Um, and so the outlook for Ukraine uh, for the next year is really very sober. Angela, good morning. When you talk about the lack of robust support from the U.S. and from Europe, it is Viktor Orban, of course, who is uh, the, the spoiler in that narrative. Does this embolden Putin uh, to, to deliver a, 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 a killing blow as he has today? I mean, it is one of the missile record missile barrage killing 18 people. This is breaking news this morning. He's attacked Kiev, Liv, Odessa uh, are under attack. Do you think that this prevarication by the United States and by the, in part, Europe emboldens Putin? 
Oh, it certainly does. If you watch the nightly uh, Russian TV shows, they are gloating uh, both about the debates within Congress and the Republicans who don't want to give any more money to Ukraine, and they're gloating about a disunited European Union. Uh, of course, it emboldens them because Putin's calculation is that if he waits this out, Western support will further erode. Uh, he is waiting for Donald Trump to be reelected. Uh, next November and hoping that then U.S. support for Ukraine. Will can, can I ask you if Trump, I, I, I mean, this is this is projection. This, this is projection. Yeah. But I want you to reflect on certain moments in the previous administration when Trump was in power. He went to meet Kim Jong-un. He he got on planes. He he sort of, bow, you know, grandstanded and did a great deal of theater. Is that our risk here? That if there's a shift in politics in the United States of America, is this campaign, is this Russia war going to play in the polls for Trump towards the campaign later this year? Well, I think it will. I mean, Trump has said that he could end this war in 24 hours. I would be interested to understand how he's going to do that. But I, it's clearly going to play, play in the election campaign in the United States. Uh, the whole question of why we're supporting Ukraine and how important it is, as he said before, uh, during his presidency, uh, to have a good relationship with Russia. And before we get, of course, to the 2024 U.S. presidential election, we have to get through the winter. And you write in your notes that the winter will be very challenging for the Ukrainians. Walk us through that. The reality on the ground is, of course, the calendar year flips here. Right. So the Ukrainian counteroffensive <clears throat> that began in June did not achieve what the Ukrainians and I think what we and the Europeans hoped it would. They were unable to take back <clears throat> a significant amount of territory. They, they need to mobilize more soldiers. Um, their uh, generals have said that now. <clears throat> they need more U.S. weapons. And if they don't get the weapons from the U.S., which is quite possible, given the debates in Congress, it will be much more difficult for them to push back if they don't get the financial assistance, both from the U.S. and from the European Union. Again, uh, their domestic situation, their economic situation will deteriorate. And Russia still has millions of people that it could mobilize. Mm. Uh, so far, Putin, who's running for re-election in March, has said that there won't be another mobilization, and maybe there won't be, at least until after the election. And the Russians, you know, they've survived the sanctions. The sanctions have not had the impact that the West hoped that they would. So Russia appears to be in a stronger position now, uh, and Ukraine really is very challenged to keep pushing back against the Russian forces. Well, on the aid conversation, of course, on the U.S. side, we've been talking about it on the program this week about a compromise needed when it comes uh, to the southern border. And uh, the expectation seems to be there that that will be achieved in January. But when it comes to the EU, you mentioned, of course, Viktor Orban's opposition. Is there a path for the EU around Hungary's veto? I think there is. And the and the EU, the European Council, they're discussing this and they've said that they hope in January that they can somehow um, avoid having to <laughs> have, uh, you know, Orban vote on this and find another way of getting the money to Ukraine. Uh, but it still has been, I think, much more challenging for them. I think the other thing we should realize is that right now the G7 countries are seriously thinking about how they can deploy the frozen frozen Russian assets, $300 billion of them, maybe not the principal, but the interest to help Ukraine. And this is a conversation that has now gained momentum. So that might be a way around some of this in the next year. Hey, Angela, just got about 30 seconds left here. There is a way, though, to peace, but maybe it's after the presidential elections. I mean, there's always a way to peace, but the question is, um, are the Russians interested in the negotiating and how much would the Ukrainians have to agree to give up mm. if there were to be peace negotiations? And I think we have to be quite clear eyed here uh, that as long as Putin is in power, even if there were peace negotiations, they would probably only be temporary because he has not given up his goal of trying to conquer all of Ukraine. All right, going to leave it on that note. Angela, thank you so much. Uh, really appreciate your insight. Angela Stent of the Brookings Institution. Shares of Carnival Corporation. They are the seventh best performer in the S&P 500, up 132 percent year to date. And we are delighted to have with us on this Friday Carnival's Josh Weinstein. He's president, CEO and chief climate officer joining us here on set. 
in New York, in town. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Almost Happy New Year. Uh, happy New Year to everybody. Thanks for having me. How are you thinking about the year? I mean, you guys have had a great one in terms of a stock run. You're working on a lot of things in terms of paring down debt. Talk to us. You just reported earnings last week, um, some pricing power. Talk to us about, about the kind of the business environment. Yeah, so the... 2023, you know, we wrapped in, in November, on November 30th, and, the, you know, the one word that we like to use as a, as a summary is record. We had record demand, record yields, record pricing, record bookings, forward bookings, record onboard spending level. So really across the board, um, our business has really thrived in 2023, and we expect much more in 2024. It can continue, because you're such a great gauge of how customers are feeling. You know, you have several brands, but you really kind of speak to, um, you know, the everyday U.S. consumer, if you will. And, I, and I, you just have a great read on it. Are they continuing to spend, are they continuing to do advanced bookings? And then once they're on their ships, Josh, continuing to spend as well. Yeah, that, that is exactly what we see. You know, as a matter of fact, our, our Q4 um, was, you know, from a pricing standpoint, the highest all year. So it's accelerating, it's not decelerating. And then when we look, uh, when we look forward, we're actually two-thirds booked for all of 2024 already. It's nice visibility. It's not too bad. Uh, <laughs> we, uh, we're about 10 points higher than we were last year. And on top of the, the ticket bookings, we've actually started pulling forward onboard spend. So we have about a, more or less about a third of our onboard spend being prepaid in advance. So we have a really good amount of visibility. And those booking trends, they just haven't slowed down. You know, every quarter this year, you know, people expect that it's got to it's got to slow down. It's got to we're going to we're going to see something. The consumer is going to get impacted. And the fact is, with our business, we haven't seen it. It's record after record. And as a matter of fact, we just ended uh, the two weeks of you know, Cyber Monday and Black Friday at more records. And it's not just coming from uh, one brand. It's not coming from the United States. It's global. It's with our global portfolio of brands, which is really, really encouraging. Do you think we're moving? Good morning. Good to meet you. Do you think we're moving from many CEOs similar to yourself that, I, that I've sat with that run global airlines and, and, and global businesses have said, we've lived through a period of revenge tourism. We were all locked up for a period of time. This is something we had this parabolic reopening and you had a parabolic rebooking. Are we evolving into some kind of new cycle? You say there's no end in sight in this demand. So have, if, if we've ended revenge tourism, how would you describe the next evolution? Yeah, that's a great question. So we don't think this is revenge anymore. This is not pent up demand. It's two years on from when we really got back in full as a, as a, as a corporation. This is people who have decided what's meaningful for them. How do I want to spend my life? And experiences are what they're looking for you know, unforgettable memories and creation with friends and family. And that's exactly what cruising has to offer. And that's what I sat down with the Accor CEO and he said, look, I haven't got enough hotel rooms and I haven't got enough high end staff to help me run this business, which then takes me to the, the cruise is the high end hotel. But to what extent are those packages off ship and onshore, those additional spans, are they critically important to the expansion and the turnaround from the loss that you've had? Do they add incrementally or significantly? So, I mean, when we think about our business, um, we're a little bit different from, from when you're looking at hotel companies. You know, I'm staying in a hotel in New York and I won't tell you which one it is, but I'll <laughs> tell you the service is not very good. Mm. Um, and we've learned how to live with that mm -hmm. as a society. It's almost should a tacit we? acceptance. No, we should not. No. And a cruise, cruise industry, our, our brands did not deviate from service level. Our guests have high expectations and we aim to exceed them. We do not close off floors. We do not shut areas down. We do not skimp on the services that we used to offer. It is full steam ahead and that's what people expect and that's what they're willing to pay for and that's what we're seeing. And let's talk a little bit about the fact that you are a global brand, of course, a global company uh, that goes many places in the world. I don't need to tell you that uh, the geopolitical landscape, very fraught right now, two hot wars and, of course, conflict in the Red Sea. Has that impacted at all where you can go? And are you seeing any inflationary pressures from some of the things that we're talking about here? So the second question uh, is no, uh, we, we haven't seen anything of note. Obviously we pay attention to crude prices, which is a good mm -hmm. barometer of a lot of things. Uh, with respect to the impact on our business, uh, we had about less than 1% of our, of our business touching 
Israel in, in one way or another, not necessarily home porting, but it might be one transit stop on a world cruise or, or something of that nature. Um, we made changes uh, some time ago. We actually don't have any ships transiting the Red Sea area for several months. Uh, and so obviously safety first, and we will, we have mitigation plans should we need to adjust where those ships would be transiting. Uh, but as of now, uh, we're in a we're in a watch and, and, and learn mode. Let's also talk about uh, your bond book, uh, because it was interesting seeing just last week, actually, S&P coming out and upgrading Carnival, not quite back to investment grade territory, but you're getting closer. Two notches higher. Two notches, Two higher. notches <laughs> higher. Uh, on earnings day, actually, you think back and uh, the chief financial officer of Carnival said that there's a real possibility that Carnival will come back to the debt markets in 2024. Where is your current thinking on that and what would actually bring you back to the debt market? Well, really, the only thing that would bring us back to the debt market, as far as we can see, is if there's opportunity to refinance on more favorable terms. So but lower rates. Yeah, lower rates. We're not or managing our maturities, but we're not looking to lever up. As a matter of fact, as, as you said in the intro, we've managed to cut down our debt load by about five billion dollars so far. Um, and we expect much more of that uh, as we go forward. You know, that's priority one, two and three when it comes to our capital structure delever. Uh, so. Hey, you know, one of the things, and it kind of ties together geopolitical, but also kind of, you know, where you're thinking about growth. Saw a story, uh, I think it was today or in the last 24 hours, that the first domestically built ship in China getting ready to uh, hit the high seas. But it's a joint venture. It's You guys are involved in this. And I think about how important China is for you guys, but also geopolitically concerns about China, its ambitions with Taiwan, and whether or not there's going to be some problems there down the road. Sure. Uh, well, we're very happy for, uh, for the folks at, uh, at the China JV. We actually uh, unwound the JV earlier this year. You did? We did. So we've been providing shipbuilding expertise support uh, for them, and we were very happy to do that. And we're the very story still says you guys are involved, but go ahead. Well, that, that could be how we're involved uh, okay. at, at this point. But from our perspective, we got a portfolio of world-class brands um, all over the world, and that's where our focus is. Um, you know, it's great for the cruise industry. The China has opened up and it will be opening up for international cruise companies. We're not going to be one of them that's going back in. Uh, we've got our assets where we want them. We've, we've changed our asset strategy. We've moved ships to different brands to accommodate the change in China, and they're doing very, very well. So we'll, uh, we'll take a wait and see approach on that as well. But not a market you need to be in right now. Just No, quickly. it's definitely not. All right, mm. gonna leave it there. Listen, so appreciate it. We know you're spending some time with family, but great to get you while you're oh, in time. My pleasure, thanks, and happy new year. Yeah, same I hope the you. New York Hotel tuned in. You should, be getting, you should be getting an upgrade. I've had the same experience in some hotels. I don't, think they, just... I don't think they have the workers. They do not. You got to see you have all the workers the that you need. We do have all the workers that we need, and and I'd encourage everybody come come book a cruise before we run out of inventory for 2024 <laughs> because it's going pretty fast. Josh Weinstein, the president and CEO of Carnival, thank you so much. So thank appreciate, you. It. appreciate it. Subscribe to the Bloomberg Surveillance Podcast on Apple, Spotify, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. Listen live every weekday starting at 7 a.m. Eastern on Bloomberg.com, the iHeartRadio app, tune in, and the Bloomberg Business app. You can watch us live on Bloomberg Television and always on the Bloomberg Terminal. Thanks so much for listening. I'm Carol Masser, and this is Bloomberg.